Good morning and welcome to our Uncommon Church community. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us today. While you're worshiping with First Parish, there are three things that we hope for you. That you would experience God, that you would get to know your neighbor a little bit better, and that you would leave this time inspired to live a life of love. If you are worshiping with us live on Sunday, May 2nd, we hope that you will chat with us. And if you are worshiping with us at a later time, we hope that you will be in touch with us. Feel free to text or to call the church phone number at 207-846-3773 or learn more about us on our website at firstparishyarmouth.org. Good morning. When we gather for worship at First Parish, we recognize that every person we meet provides us with an opportunity to know God more fully. I invite you at this time to greet those around you with the peace of Christ. If you're watching by yourself, send someone a text or email or make a call later to let someone know you see them. The peace of Christ be with you. We have an announcement today. Um, we will be having a community day today, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. on the First Parish Lawn. Join us, please, in celebration and congratulations for our three confirmands on completing their journey through confirmation. Hope to see you there. And so we begin. I invite you to take a deep breath. Center yourself. Let us be the church in worship. Will you join us for our opening prayer? This morning's prayer is written by Reverend Monica Thompson Smith. Give us a moment, God, or rather remind us to honor the moments you've already given us. Give us a sign, God, or rather open our eyes to the signs you put right in front of us. Give us some space, God, or rather, help us relish the freedom we already have. Give us your grace, God. Or rather, remind us that it's already ours. Thank you. Amen. <laughs>
One of the traditions here at First Parish is the sharing of a peace candle, where we invite members of our congregation and our community to share how God is moving in and among their lives. This morning, we're grateful to hear a reflection from Sue Comstock on how God is moving in her life. Thanks, Sue. Good morning. My name is Sue Comstock. I'm pleased to share this peace candle with you today. Peace candles help us to connect with each other and with all the happenings in our uncommon church community. At a recent deacons meeting, we pondered a question. How can we provide programming to reach out to teens in our church and in our community? As we all know, teenage years are a challenge. In addition to coping with COVID, the kids' schedules and places to be and places not to be are all upside down. But there are ways in which they can have a place to be and a place to go. A lot of their lives have been postponed or canceled. So we pondered these quest this question about what can we do, and then we said, well, wait a minute. Why are we thinking about what kids need, what teens want? Of course, we should ask the teens. So we decided that each deacon would ask a teen what was your experience of church? What could church offer to meet some of your needs at this time? And then we'd give feedback to each other at the next deacons meeting. Well, here comes some of the feedback. Schedules are tight. School is all confused sometimes now. And we did have a job, but we don't now. We want alone time and our parents want us to have family time, but there was some interest in Bible study. There was some interest in service projects or a summer experience. Much focus was on short-term short experiences, such as one month or of once a week program, a seasonal once a month program, once a month school experience, summer experience. And as we continued to ponder and reflect on what the teens had said to us. I talked with my granddaughters, they're 13 and 15. And I said, what's your experience of church? And they said, well, we go to church on Christmas and Easter. And we used to go to Sunday school. We drew pictures and ate goldfish. And Nana, we went to your parent pageant. That was our favorite. Hmm, I thought, we all thought together. There are some clues here being together, doing something, eating something. <clears throat> Could our church offer some programming that does just that for our teens? Young people, being, doing, eating together, short term. So as we continue our pondering, we want you to join us. If you have a teen in your life or in your neighborhood that you know, have a conversation with that team. And if you pick up any clues, send them to Jamie on an email. Oh, I almost forgot. Just recently, I had a conversation with a 90-year-old man. He had grown up on Monjoy Hill. He was part of his congregational church. And part of his experience during those years included a hayride. They were given a couple of times a year and guess what? He met the woman he later married because of that hayride. The experience provided something to do with others, a place to go, and I haven't asked him about food, but stay tuned. I'll tell you later.
Good morning. Today's reading is from the Gospel of John, the 21st and last chapter. Chapter 21 is is interesting for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that scholars disagree about whether the 21st chapter is the end of John or not. There is discussion as to whether the 21st chapter is an epilogue written by John or whether it was an add-on by others late in the first century uh, AD. Uh, I think the commentators as a whole seem to be now coming to a place where uh, it was written by John, possibly as an epilogue, and the discussion of whether it fits as an add-on, an epilogue, or as part of the original gospel is really exalting form over substance. There are also a variety of other issues with chapter 21. First of all, chapter 21 itself is really three pieces. What we're reading this morning, the appearance of Jesus to the disciples, the fourth time he has appeared after his crucifixion is one portion, and then it is followed by Peter being interrogated, if you will, by Jesus, and then being commissioned, perhaps, to lead the church. And then lastly, an identification of the heretofore anonymous beloved disciple as being John, although even that is a little ambiguous if you read it carefully. Other reasons for why chapter 21, even of the portion we're looking at this morning, the, the description in the first 14 verses of Jesus' appearance to the disciples, is a focus on the rich detail uh, that is included within that story and whether any of those details have significance. We start with whether or not uh, the, you know, or why the disciples are even in Galilee. Now, perhaps that's because if we listen to Mark, Jesus told them in his first appearance, or one of his first appearances, that he would meet them in Galilee. But other questions, why are they fishing? Why, why this particular place? Why 153 fish? Why not 152 or 154 or 100 or 200? Why the focus on Peter's clothing or lack thereof? Why the focus on whether the net is broken or not? However, I think several of the commentators raise what I think is perhaps uh, the best question here, which is that maybe all of this detail is simply to make a really good story. And focusing on the detail misses the point. And that the point of this story is that Jesus, in this last telling of an appearance by John, is not in a special time or a special place, but rather he is meeting the disciples in their everyday lives, their everyday job, 
their everyday work, and that he is there and fully with them once they are open to seeing him and experiencing him. With that thought, hear these words from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, the New Revised Standard Version. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed them himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they found a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now some of the disciples, uh, none, now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Here ends this reading. May God increase and improve our understanding of it. There are many ways to read and interpret scripture. For starters, you can read scripture in its original language, focusing on the details of verb tenses and word translations. You can read scripture from multiple translations to note the discrepancies among scholars and different traditions. You can interpret scripture using movies and music and media that are influenced by certain passages. Some of you have certainly read scripture in contemplative ways before, using spiritual practices to enhance your reading and understanding of the text. Lectio Divina, or divine reading of sacred texts, is one such practice to contemplate scripture. Readers are invited to listen closely to the word read aloud and to note single words or short phrases through which God is speaking to them. Through prayer and meditation, the reader grows deeper in exploration and understanding of the selected reading. A newer spiritual practice, one that might be less familiar to many of us, is Visio Divina or divine seeing of sacred stories through visual art. We have touched on this practice a bit through our use of sanctified art materials in Lent and throughout other seasons. Visual art tends to elicit emotions as we read sacred texts, bringing us closer in connection to God and bridging the gap between our story 
and God's story. So why am I spending time talking about reading and interpreting scripture? Over the past few weeks, we've engaged familiar stories from the Bible. Stories that if you've attended church really at any point in your life, you've probably heard them before. We've been reading about Jesus's resurrection appearances to his disciples. First, to the disciples in the locked upper room, where Thomas was able to touch the wounds in Jesus's side. Second, Jesus appeared to the disciples traveling along the road to Emmaus. They recognized Jesus, but not until Jesus broke bread with them. And third, today's story brings us to the Sea of Galilee, where disciples have decided to return to their work of fishing and encounter Jesus through a fish fry brunch on the beach. It is possible that our tendency is to tune out some of the stories that feel familiar to us. Oh, I've heard that before. No need to listen too closely today. I've been familiar with this passage since I was a young child. There can't possibly be anything new that I'll learn today. But the truth is that God continues to speak to us in new ways, through age-old stories. And so we are called to listen again and again and again, seeking a fresh perspective on the text in light of our present experiences. I wonder how God is speaking to us today through this story. Today I'd like to introduce you to another practice that you can use and maybe we will use as a congregation to read and interpret scripture. I'm going to retell today's story using a method called godly play. Godly play is a storytelling practice intended for all ages and stages. To hear God's word anew and to wonder about the story beyond its initial reading. This is simply another way to read and interpret scripture in a new way. So friends, listen and watch. Use your imagination and then wonder together, noticing how God is speaking to you anew today through this familiar story. On this Sunday in the season of Easter, we remember how the disciples went north to Galilee as Jesus had told them. It was a long journey, some 80 miles. It took them about four days to walk. Many of them were fishermen So they went to the Sea of Galilee to rest. This was a place they had known since they were children. This is where they had fished with their fathers. And suddenly, Peter stood up and said, I'm going fishing. And the rest went with him to prepare the boat. Soon, they pushed out into the lake. Their sail filled with wind, and they fished all night. But they caught nothing. Still, the sounds and smells of the lake comforted them. They were home. In the morning, the sky turned pink and then blue. They could make out the shore, and someone standing 
by a fire. They could see the smoke and the red glow from the charcoal burning. Have you caught anything? And all they could say was no. Throw your nets to the other side. What could they lose? They pulled in the empty nets and threw them out on the other side. They could feel the fish moving as they held their ropes. John was not paying attention to fish. He leaned forward and watched the man standing on the shore. He said to Peter, it is the Lord. And Peter stood up, he jumped, he swam. He felt the sand under his feet and he waded ashore. The other turned the boat toward land. The nets were so full that they could not pull them in. So they dragged them behind the boat. And as they walked toward the fire, the stranger called out, bring some fish. When they gathered around the fire, the stranger was no stranger. They all knew it was Jesus, but they were afraid to say anything. Have some breakfast, said Jesus. There were fish cooking on the fire. He gave them fish and bread, and they talked as they shared a meal. The fish and the bread also tasted of home. Let us wonder together. I wonder how the disciples felt when Jesus didn't seem to be around anymore. I wonder why Peter decided to go fishing again. I wonder how all the disciples felt fishing all night long and catching nothing. I wonder how the person on the beach knew where the fish would be. I wonder how the disciples know who the person on the beach is. I wonder how they knew it was Jesus. I wonder what Jesus and the disciples talked about while eating fish and bread on the beach. I wonder what the disciples will do now that they have talked to Jesus again. I wonder what it is that we can take away from today's story.
Jesus knew that it would be harder to follow him than to simply understand. So he gathered his friends for a meal to hear the story and then to be filled with the courage that it will take to live as part of that story. He still gathers his friends for a meal to be strengthened for the journey, not to fill our minds with the right answers, but to fill our bodies with the same love that he carried in his own, that we might love with our whole strength, our whole being, our whole mind, and our whole heart. God calls us to this table and sends us out filled so that we might live out God's love for all. This table is for those who know a lot and those who know nothing, those who love fully and those who want to love more, those who come regularly and those who are still seeking. This table does not belong to First Parish, it belongs to God. And it is God who invites all to share in this feast of love and life. So let us pray. It is our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. For blessed are you, O Lord, our God. You have created something out of nothing. You have called a people to inhabit your kingdom. You have filled the earth with good things. You have offered us your very life that we might live with you. And so we give you thanks, for your blessedness spills over and blesses us all. We pray for your blessings to cover us and our world again this day. Bless this, your church, with passion for your good news and a longing for grace. Bless this community with compassion that we might serve the least of these among us and in doing so, encounter you. Bless this nation with freedom and justice for all, that every person may share abundantly in its promise. Bless your world with eyes to see and ears to hear, so that no part of creation goes unloved or uncared for. Bless us with faith, O God, to help build the kingdom you are creating in our midst. And as we come to this table celebrating again that hope lives and moves among us, remind us that suffering does not have the last word. Where there is pain or illness, may your healing presence abound. Where there is despair or hatred, may your love be visible. Where there is violence or distrust, may your life be a beacon of hope. Bring peace to your world, O oh God. And we pray these things and all things in the name of Christ who lived, who died, who rose, and lives forevermore, hosting this and every feast. We pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this table, we remember the familiar story of how on the night of your betrayal, Jesus gathered with friends for a Passover meal. He took bread, he blessed it, he gave thanks, and he broke it. He shared it with his friends. He said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, remember me. And it's in the same way that after supper, Jesus took the cup. He poured out the wine. He blessed it. He gave thanks and he shared it with his friends. He said, this, the wine in this cup is like the blood in my veins, poured out to give you new life. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. 
Holy Spirit, come and fill this bread and juice, simple gifts offered for a simple cause. May this meal nourish our bodies so that we may be strengthened for this journey. May this meal give us courage to live lives worthy of our calling. May this meal make us once again your body of Christ, loving, serving, and caring for all the world. Amen. Beloved, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let us share. The bread of life, broken for you. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us drink wine together on our knees. Let us drink wine together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us praise God together on our knees. Let us praise God together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun, O oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Edward Perrinet, the author of our final hymn this morning, was a friend of Charles and John Wesley. During 1749, he traveled with John as an itinerant preacher. Many times they would be met by angry mobs. And John records one occasion when stones were hurled at them and Edward Perrinet was thrown down and rolled in mud and mire. Nevertheless, Perrinet continued to preach and wrote several volumes of hymns. This is the only one that has endured. But what a legacy this single hymn has had. And so as we sing this hymn, picture yourself joining with all those mentioned here. Angels and martyrs, saints and sinners, every kindred, every tribe. Worship Jesus. Hail the power of his almighty 